So. What I'm trying to do is imagine having a All right, so I'm just going to quickly introduce the panel. Um, this is the funding panel and uh, with entrepreneurship, where you get your cash from and all of that is very important, obviously. Um, so first we have Deborah Jackson, the founder of Plum Alley, which is the crowdfunding angle in which helps women raise money for their ventures, connect to experts, and sell their products. We have Alicia Surrett, the founder and CEO of Pentagram, Pentagram Capital, an angel investment network focused on seed and early stage investments in New York. Um, and we have Will Porteous, general partner and COO of RRE Ventures, which is one of the biggest and most active VC funds in New York. And over here we have KJ Singh, director of Techstars NYC, which is the top incubator. Um, and our moderator is Jerry Newman, who's the founder of New Capital, an early stage investor in New York focused on taking an early and active role in companies they invest in. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jerry. Thanks. So I also teach a course here, by the way, on entrepreneurship at the engineering school. If any of you want to be entrepreneurs and are engineers, um, it's called Managing Technological Innovation. Um, so who here saw the, um, the earlier panel on venture capital, uh, Alan Patrickhoff and, and Dave Tisch? Okay, yeah. So they were talking about how much venture capital has changed over the past, I guess, 40 years since, uh, since Patrickhoff started in it, 45 years. Um, and this is actually, this panel is the result of that. So we have four people with four different methods of funding startups. And what we're going to talk about is what, how do, what kinds of startups they fund, which kind of funding should you look for if you have a startup, what they, what they look for when they're uh, choosing which startups to fund, all of these things. And at the end, we'll have a uh, question and answer session. So think of some questions. Um, but first, we're going to start with having each of the panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about what their firms do to help entrepreneurs raise money. You want to start? Sure. So uh, I don't know how many, uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, accelerators, but Techstars is an accelerator founded in 2007 in Boulder, Colorado. Now we are in seven cities uh, throughout the world, six in the U.S., one in London. And we also do uh, Powered by programs where we'll partner with corporates. Um, and essentially what we do is we, we get on, involved in the very, very, very early stage of a company. We invest a little bit of capital um, and really provide the companies with a lot of mentorship with uh, really successful entrepreneurs that come in and provide guidance, uh, venture capitalists, and really get them ready for the next stage. And when companies finish up the program, they typically go on to raise about a million and a half. It's a three month long program. They go on to raise about a million and a half afterwards after the demo day. And uh, we are in the fifth program in New York and our demo day is coming up in June. Right. Will? Uh, sure. So I'm Will Porteous. Uh, I'm a general partner and the chief operating officer of RRE Ventures. I'm also an adjunct uh, faculty member in the business school here. Um, RRE manages uh, $1.5 in total assets. The firm has been around for 20 years. We just closed uh, our sixth fund, a $280 million fund. And all of our investing activity is as early stage, active, lead investors. So we partner with entrepreneurs in the formative period with their companies. We're often involved before there's a product. We're often involved when there's just a few team members. And um, we write two kinds of checks. We write uh, seed checks of between $100,000 and $500,000 a year. Uh, and we write about 20 of those a year uh, into new seed companies. And then our primary business is investing initial checks of between two and a half and seven and a half million dollars. Uh, we started that seed program, uh, the smaller checks, about three or four years ago. They're now in aggregate about 60 companies in it. It's been very successful for us. And out of that seed program, we've had a number of pretty significant winners that grew nicely, went on to become deals that we wanted to lead as primary investments, and, and subsequently had very successful outcomes. Alicia. Uh, so my name is Alicia Surratt. I should tell you, uh, first off, I went through the EMBA Global uh, program here at Columbia, so I'm an alum and happy to be back on campus. Um, so I, my career is, background was in the financial industry. I worked for a number of large hedge funds and private equity firms and then became an entrepreneur myself. So I was the first employee and CAO of what became a multi-billion dollar private equity firm. Uh, and it was really crazy. We grew to you know, 60, 70 employees in the first six months, we launched simultaneously in, in uh, 
London, New York, Hong Kong, Mumbai, uh, and basically did anything and everything to make sure that the company was up and running. Uh, and it was through that experience that I decided I never wanted to leave the startup world again. And so after things became steady state, I took some time off to travel. And then when I came back, I set up an LLC to serve as a vehicle for my own investments. So I uh, currently make angel investments. I'm a full-time investor. I just recently got elected to the board of New York Angels. So I'm very actively involved in that as well as um, part of Golden Seeds. I, um, uh, I serve as the chairman of the board of one of my portfolio companies. I serve on the advisory board for three others. I invest both directly in companies and also in funds. Um, so in aggregate, I probably have exposure to about 25 or so startup companies. Um, yeah, that's it. Hi. Deborah. Hi, I'm Deborah Jackson, the founder and CEO of a company called Plum Alley. And um, I have can wear a number of different hats. I went to the business school. After business school, I went to Goldman Sachs. I worked on Wall Street for 21 years. Um, I ended up doing healthcare, internet, and technology companies at the very end. And um, after Wall Street, I uh, retired from Wall Street, but I didn't retire from my career. I became an active angel investor, and I have a portfolio of a number of companies. I, um, two years ago, decided I would actually start a company myself because I wanted to be more involved in the startup community in New York. And I thought if I was just going to be angel investing, I was somewhat on the sidelines. And so I founded a company um, called Plum Alley. Uh, I also am a co-founder of an accelerator program called Women Innovate Mobile. And I um, am very obsessed with financing and getting money to early stage companies. I don't think there's enough capital out there. It's part of the reason that my company now provides crowdfunding, a crowdfunding option. And I'm very interested in the money that you can raise before you go to angel investors or VCs. And, and I feel like the you know really, really early stage market is, is somewhat new and underserved. So that's what I'm about. Thank you. Right. So let's start with, um, KJ, what kinds of companies are you looking for to bring into Techstars? So that's a pretty, pretty open question. <laughs> well, and, and I don't mean industry. I mean, well, industry would be fine too, but what do they look like? What, what does the team look like? What does the idea look like? Where are they in their life cycle? So typically, a company that comes to Techstars will have some sort of product, right? You have to think about what Techstars is. It's an accelerator program. It's a three-month program where you're trying to get the most out of it, the most out of the mentorship, the most out of the people that you're going to be meeting with. So if you don't have a product, it's really hard for you to make, make, it worth your, make it worth your while. So we typically look for companies that have some sort of product, some sort of traction. And what we try to look for, the biggest thing at the earliest stage, what we tell companies when they're, when they're applying is we look at five things. And the first three things that we look are our team. Right? So team is the most important thing. Team, 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 product, and market. And the reason why a team is so important is because at the earliest stages of a company, it's the execution that matters more. Um, what we tell people all the time is, look, you can have a great idea and a mediocre team, and they won't, they won't make it with, with what they have. But if you have a great team and a mediocre idea, you probably have a lot better chances of success. So in order for us to determine whether or not the team is executing and really making progress, the entrepreneurs usually set up a dialogue with us before the applications are open. So we try to you know, do outreach with the community, try to meet with them so they can start sending us updates on their progress and how they're scaling up or how they're hitting their KPIs or what progress they're making. Because that's a clue for us to use to see if they're going to be able to execute while they're in the program. Okay. Alicia, how about you? Yeah, so I, you could answer this question, I guess, in two ways. And one is what, what the company looks like at that moment and then also, like, what do you look for in the business? And that's partly what, what you were mentioning. I mean, in general, I look for uh, companies that are based in the New York City area. I, the companies I invest in, I like them to kind of create an ecosystem amongst themselves and be helpful to each other. It's usually when they're at the point where it's maybe like one to four team members involved. Um, and they're at, they're, they've been bootstrapping for a while. They've put a fair amount of their own capital into the business, and they've likely raised money from their friends and family. And now they're ready for you know, more institutional type money. Um, they could be uh, pre-incubator or accelerator. I could be investing in them coming out of uh, an incubator or accelerator. I could also co-invest you know, along, on, alongside um, the VC lines. Um, but generally, the valuation would be maybe between one and four million for the company. And the company is looking to raise in total maybe like 500,000 to a million dollars. Um, and then just to echo a number of things that uh, KJ said, 
um, the, and this is more in terms of the business, you know, I would look for a company that's playing in like a billion plus market overall um, and that has a good understanding of their competitive positioning, you know, what differentiates them from competitors and also what kind of barriers to entry um, they, they've created to prevent other people from replicating what they've done. I'd like to see some traction. That could mean that they're generating revenues, but it also could mean that they have momentum in other areas. If they're growing their user base rapidly or there's adoption of their product, something along those lines. Um, I like to see that they have, uh, you know, people, people from strong backgrounds that are relevant to that business and they understand how they're selling the product and what their marketing plan is. Um, and then also, you know, I, th I think a lot of entrepreneurs think about fundraising, but they don't necessarily think about how the investors are going to get their money back. And so to, to invest in someone that has a really good understanding of what that exit strategy is. So if we're putting money into your company, how are we eventually getting money back? So, so this, the stage at which I invest is when I think those, the entrepreneurs um, not only fit the criteria I mentioned first off, but also understand and have, um, like, have a really good understanding of all those other criteria that I just mentioned. Like a really good story and really knowledgeable about all of those, those criteria. Okay, thanks. How about, let's go to you, Will. I mean, so you have both the seed fund and the main fund. Um, mm -hmm. Can you give us a criteria actually for each of them? Sure. I mean, there's, there's more commonality than there is uh, contrast. The, the, the seed program we created uh, in part because we were seeing so many talented entrepreneurs that we wanted to say yes to, but they were not in a position to take a two and a half to three or four million dollar check, nor would it have been prudent to, to invest that amount of money into a company that was just getting going. Um, but as things have gotten more competitive in the venture business over time, uh, those seed companies that uh, grow up and grow fast and start to show real promise often get their capital just from around the table. So part of the reason we did this was to make sure we had a seat at the table when these things started to really take off and do well. In terms of the criteria... Um, and by, by that you mean they, they take money from the people who've already invested. Exactly, in that's right. So, they, so the, the, the subsequent financings get fully subscribed by the people who are already investors in the company. Um, from, from the standpoint of criteria, we're, I, like to, I like to say to my partners, I mean, we're, in, we're in the movie business. We're, we're looking for talent every day, right? We're looking for super talented people uh, pursuing a, an incredible storyline. That's the market that they're going after with, with uh, you know, a, a great, deep, and powerful original insight. That's, the, that's the, the clever bit to it, hopefully some real innovation. Those things, uh, there's, there's a remarkable number of parallels. When we do seed deals, it allows us to say yes to those things when there's very little substance to it. When we do a, a primary investment, we're putting two and a half, three, four, five million dollars. We're taking a board seat. We're pursuing an ownership stake that's probably more like 20% to a third of the company. And we're making a big personal commitment, a big firm commitment to supporting that company over time. We need to see a much more fully fleshed out team. We want to see a working product. We want to know that the innovation works. And most of all, we want to know that the customers really want it, that there's, there's tangible evidence of real demand, along with some of the things that Alicia and, and, um, and KJ have uh, outlined in terms of market size and that sort of thing. Now, Deborah, crowdfunding is a little different than, right? So you're not yeah. the ones writing the checks, but is there any criteria to get for people to put their projects on your platform? And then how do they become successful at, at, at bringing money to their project? So it, there are actually are a lot of parallels that I see between someone who's launching a crowdfunding campaign and someone who has a company maybe going to an accelerator or maybe you know, growing a company and, and getting VC funding. So I think what's really important is the person really has to care. And, and I don't think you can stress enough the whole passion you know, component of this because when you do anything, a, a crowdfunding campaign, you are going to put in a fair amount of work and to, to raise a small amount of money. And you really have to um, want to do that. And I, I've seen entrepreneurs over time that sort of outgrew the, their interest in what they started off doing. So I think it's w what I look for in my angel investing and then for the WIM Accelerator is really people that um, this is a mission for them. It is beyond a business. You know, it, it's like they are going to do this come hell or high water, and they are, are just going to keep going when the going is rough. 
and, and it's, it's almost a calling. And I think that's what differentiates people that are just kind of trendy, I want to be an entrepreneur, I'm going to start a company, I have this idea, versus people who, you know, this, this is really, really important to them. So I think that's, that's the first thing. For crowdfunding, it's a relatively new form of raising money. It's only been around for a couple of years. And it involves you actually putting together a campaign and going to your network to raise a small amount of money. When it comes into play for entrepreneurs, it's generally when you have a product and you want to test market your product. So you can put a prototype up and you can go out to your network and beyond and raise a little bit of money for that. And that's really important because you can find out if actually you have people that will pay for your product or put in pre-orders. If you have pre-orders, that's a beautiful thing because that actually gives you the money you need to go into production. And once you, you, you have your product out there, um, it's easier to raise other money. One of the companies that was on our site doing pre-orders pre of a product, actually a venture capital firm discovered them on our site and they stopped their campaign because they got a huge infusion of cash from the outside. So I think what we're going to see over time is actually some other sources of capital looking for interesting products or traction um, and you can easily see that right there on the internet. So let's talk about what you do besides money. Um, let's start with you, Will, actually. So sure. You write somebody a check, um, and then you just walk away and wait till they sell the company? Yeah, we hope, we hope they call. <laughs> yeah. the, um, you know, in the best situations, our relationship with the entrepreneur is such that the money is almost an afterthought. We're, we're involved in the collaboration very early on. Um, we're doing a, a, a new company on the West Coast right now that's in the satellite space. And we started working with the entrepreneur nine months ago. Uh, we recruited over Christmas break, we helped him recruit a CTO. Um, and this week we are closing on a CFO candidate for the company. So a lot of recruiting. Uh, we've been involved in a lot of partnership conversations. We brought some other investors to the table. Oh, we haven't put any money in this company yet, right? We're just working with the entrepreneur because we really like where, where uh, he's going and we're excited to be a part of it. So the, the collaborations often are, are sort of us bringing the resources of the firm, our relationships, our experience with other portfolio companies, our transaction experience. And we try to do that with companies that we like, even if we aren't yet investors. Alicia, how about you? Yeah, so before I got involved as an angel investor, I read a number of books in the space just to kind of get smart on what was correlated with the top returns. And two of the things that stood out were that before you make an investment, the importance of spending at least 20 hours with the entrepreneur. Um, and you probably have heard this in other panels, there's the whole concept of dots versus lines, right? You, by the time you make the investment, you, you want to have a series of dots, i.e. a series of interactions that you have with the entrepreneur. And it and then those series of dots kind of form a line where it, you know, by, by the time you've had that series of interaction, it seems, it seems to make sense, right? You've built a relationship over time. Um, and then afterwards, after you make the investment, the other correlation with returns is um, staying heavily involved in the business. And so I, I do both of those, those two things. And specifically on um, getting involved uh, with the business afterwards, I don't micromanage. I, having been an entrepreneur once myself, that's something that would have driven me crazy. But, um, but I am super responsive, so anytime someone reaches out to me, I'm always there to, um, to talk to them. I'm constantly in formal meetings with them. Um, but more importantly, they have access to anyone in my network. I'm constantly making introductions. I'm constantly available for strategic talks. And it could be things as simple as, you know, well, not even simple, but um, things that I went through as an entrepreneur myself, firing people, dealing with outside counsel, things of that nature. Um, and so it's, it's really whatever and whenever they need me. I mean, last night I just spent an hour building a, you know, party, partly building an Excel model for one of my entrepreneurs because she needed something done quickly and I was happy to do it, um, just having been a banker by background. So, so you know, I, I stay pretty heavily involved in my companies and have very strong relationship with all of the entrepreneurs in which I've directly invested. Great. AJ? We're, we're very involved. I mean, if you, if you think about what we do, we're an accelerator, so all the companies that are accepted into the program, they're actually on site with us. So we have meetings with them every week. Uh, they, we have an open door policy, anything and everything that they need, uh, they can come to us at any time of day, any time of night, uh, and they do. So we, we're just, we want to be 100% available whenever they need any help. Uh, but beyond that, so 
we also help the companies when they leave the program, right? So what we're trying to build at Techstars is a network of entrepreneurs. There's over three, close to 350 companies in our portfolio now. So if you need to know somebody in some other industry or some you know, competitor or somebody that you want to have an introduction to, we can probably make that introduction for you through one of our other programs in, the, in another city um, or one of the other uh, portfolio companies. So we, we are able to leverage that network that we're creating. Um, but we also do the hiring help and you know, how do you hire, how do you fire, all that kind of stuff. So we, we're, we're just trying to create this really strong network that they can leverage. So what's life like for somebody who goes through your program? It's, it's intense. Um, it's, we, we try to tell them, look, we're compressing about two years of your life into three months. Um, and, you know, they're getting a lot of feedback. The very first month we call it Mentor Madness because they literally meet up to close to over 100 people, 100, you know, operators from other industries, venture capitalists. And they get a lot of feedback. And oftentimes this feedback is not consistent. And that's okay because what we want these guys to understand is there's a lot of noise. But overall, you're going to start seeing a pattern. And with that pattern, you should start figuring out what the, you know, what you should really be focusing on for your business. And uh, it's it's intense. Probably 80 plus hours every week. Um, they're pivoting, iterating on their business. We don't want to call it pivoting. It's more about iterating and refining their business model. And uh, that's the first month, second month, and then the third month they start thinking about fundraising and uh, how much capital they're they're going to likely need to raise that'll last them 12 to 18 months post program. So the seed route that they need to kind of think about. Right, and, and at the end, you have the demo day, right? We have the demo day. And that's, uh, you know, 500 plus investors typically come to the demo day, uh, primarily made up of angel investors as well as venture capitalists. And uh, that's really where they unveil what they've been working on during the program so they can show the progress that they've had and uh, hopefully form new partnerships, signed up new customers, hired new folks that are on the team, you know, just really building up the team. Right. So. Deborah, I want to ask you, I, I'll, you can answer the same question, but I want to ask you a little bit of a slightly different question. Um, if somebody uses your platform to raise money, I mean, you, you can't just build it and people will come, right? I mean, how, how do they get people to invest? Who invests through the platform? How do they get the, the people to know about their project? And, and how much do you help people to do that? So our platform is reward-based crowdfunding, and that's different from equity-based. So basically, um, you put up a project and you go first to your community. Everybody has a network of 500 people or more, and you're first going to be able to go to your, your network, your LinkedIn, your college class, your you know, religious institution, whatever, and, and you will go to those people first through dedicated emails, and they will probably, if they're friends, fund your campaign. And that will give you enough money to get going. The campaigns themselves generally have about 20% will come to fund your project from outside your own circle. So think of it first as you need to you know, connect with your circle first. That's on reward-based crowdfunding. When you get over to the equity side, um, what, what happens there is um, you need to be on a platform with a very big outreach. And that's what's happening now on the internet. When you go to a typical accelerator program or VC firm, um, you're pretty much buying into their network. And so one of the things when you look at an accelerator program or a VC firm is really look at their network. Like who, what other companies have they funded? Have they been successful? Um, what other firms do they form a syndicate with? All of that is really, really important because I always say to entrepreneurs, you have to think they need you as much as you need them. So their whole business model rests on you being successful. So they need you. So they're going to be looking around at the best companies. So when you go into the meetings, r remember, it's, you're courting them, and they're court they should be courting you too. So um, just keep that balance of power in mind. That's actually a good point. I mean, so we've told people what you're looking for in entrepreneurs. What do you think entrepreneurs should be looking for when they, when they come to you, Will? I mean, there's several hundred active venture firms in this country. Um, you know, why, why would they come to you, or why should they pick a specific venture firm over the other ones? So I think the, the entrepreneurs who, who do their diligence, uh, who have choices, should really focus hard on the, the follow through and the collaborative relationship that the investor either has or has not had with their prior companies. When I'm serious about a deal, I will hand a CEO unsolicited a sheet of references on every CEO I've ever backed in my 14 years in the business. And I invite him to call any of them. 
or to call anyone in our portfolio. Um, and this is, you know, as a firm, when we compete for deals, this is how we win, frankly. Um, because we as a firm have, frankly, worked pretty hard to help our companies. And that's the, um, that's really uh, our relationship equity with the entrepreneurial community. And I want to bring that out uh, in the process. And so I, I encourage all entrepreneurs out there as you're raising money, do your references, make your calls, um, and don't feel like you have to uh, put up with anything in this process. You're selling a portion of your company. It's your company. And whoever you do that deal with is someone that um, you're going to end up having a pretty long-term relationship with. And there are going to be stress points in that relationship. So I think it's, um, it's vitally important. Um, there's a, there's a follow-through question that I think every entrepreneur has to ask. Um, I've been in a lot of board meetings for a lot of venture-backed companies, and I've heard a lot of investors promise all kinds of things in the, in the course of that two or three hour board meeting. And I often ask myself, how much follow through is there really after the fact? Um, that's what entrepreneurs should be grading their investors on. Well, what's the, the um, time period between when you first invest, or your firm first invests, and when you exit? I mean, I know there's a range, but what's normal? Well, I mean, was, you know, a year or two ago, average holds in the venture industry were up to eight or nine years. So it's a, it's a long term thing. So that they'd have to deal with you for eight or nine years? Potentially. Or, 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 or a succession of people from the firm. And, you know, entrepreneurs have to ask questions about the staying power of the institutions, venture firms in particular, that they're taking capital from. There are a lot of venture firms out there. Um, some of them are healthier than others in terms of their financial performance, their ability to raise a new fund, growth in the partnership, the partnership's ability to help them and support them. Those are things that people have to explore. You know, average hold times are starting to come down now that we have, or had, as of a few weeks ago, an IPO market again. Uh, and we have seen the pace of M&A certainly pick up. But it's a multi-year relationship at minimum. So KJ, we, anybody who saw Alan Patrikoff uh, saw that him, him claim that there were, I think he said 25,000 accelerators in the United States. I don't remember the exact number was, but it was somewhere up there. Um, why, why, what, what should they, people look for in an accelerator or an incubator? Um, I, I think it's some of the same things that Will had mentioned, right? Um, David Cohen, the founder of Techstars, wrote a blog post about, you know, you, when you're thinking about which accelerator program that you're you know, potentially applying to, make sure you do your homework, right? Make sure they're open about letting you talk to the companies that have come through and got, have gone through the program. Um, look at who they've invested, how long they've been around for. Because there's a lot of accelerators that are open up that aren't maybe as transparent as they should be about what they're doing, how much equity they're taking, what they're providing in exchange for the 6% or whatever they're taking. So I think it's a lot about doing your homework and just understanding who has gone through the program, if they're willing to open up the references. I mean, you guys should be comfortable enough reaching out to any, pro any company that went through the program, right? We shouldn't give you a list and you, you know, can only contact those. You should be you know, able to contact anybody. And, the feedback that you get from those, talking to those entrepreneurs is really key. So Alicia, AngelList uh, has about 40,000 people signed up as angel investors. I don't think they're all actually investing. Okay. Um, but from the entrepreneur's point of view, it has to be pretty confusing, uh, as well as difficult Probably. to find out you know, both who they should talk to and how to get to them. Yeah. Any, uh, any clues for the audience? Yeah, I mean, that's, it's a good question. Um, these are you know, kind of basic answers to get you started on, on this, but there's a website, the Angel Capital Association, and it lists all the different angel groups. I mean, for the most part, a lot, a lot of the large angel groups in the country. And um, so if you clicked into some of the groups like a Golden Seeds or a New York Angels, oftentimes they have all of their members listed. And for New York Angels in particular, our, not, not only our names listed, but you click into our names, you get our LinkedIn profile or website. And I think that the onus really is on the entrepreneur, I mean, this is, I'm kind of reiterating a lot of what's been said, to do their homework and really figure out um, who, who would be right for you. I mean, the, the diligence goes both ways, right? So, so a good starting point would be to read a lot about someone's backgrounds, right? Like a lot of the angels get involved in your business because maybe they come from that industry, they can bring strategic value to your firm, they're passionate about it because they feel like they bring a lot of knowledge to the table. So looking through people's backgrounds and figuring out like, could this person be helpful to me? Is this something that they 
have a lot of knowledge about, um, and that's that's a good starting place for sure. Um, and then another way you could think about it is um, what have they invested in the past? So if you go onto AngelList and you have a sense of their portfolio companies, through those investments, do they have knowledge in the type of you know work that I'm doing or the industry that I'm into? And is are there things that they could have potentially learned from those portfolio companies that could be valuable to me? Would I maybe have synergies with that ecosystem, knowing that they would probably introduce me to some of their other investments? So yeah, it's really, it's really doing a lot of diligence on the person's background and what their actions have been uh, as an investor and figuring out what synergies are, you know, exist with your, with your business. Yeah. And same question, Deborah. So the crowdfunding space is pretty new, um, but every week you see a new crowdfunding site. Um, how would you, if you were an entrepreneur, choose which crowdfunding site to put your project up on? I, th I think it's important to um, look at the different options and say which is the site that seems to um, resonate best with what you're doing. So if you're an arts or creative type of site, Kickstarter is probably the place to go. They're, and they've been very vocal about their, they don't want to do pre-orders for products for entrepreneurial companies. So. I think you have to look at the different sites. Obviously, our site is very geared towards women because we feel that women, uh, their ventures are underfunded. There's a lot of data out there that says that. So that's an underserved market that, that I feel very important and very strongly about. And so, uh, but, but keep in mind here that you're first going to raise about 80% of what you raise within your own circle. So that 20%, you want to find a site that will have other people that have similar interests or will be interested in your type of, pro of project. So it's early for crowdfunding, and I think you'll see a whole lot in the next couple of years. It gets very confused now because of the Jobs Act and the ability of um, non-accredited investors potentially to come in the market and, and invest online. And that's what AngelList is all about. Um, we're you know, going to get to in the future and some other crowdfunding sites. Right now, they have accredited investors that are essentially wealthy people that sign up to invest. But going forward, there will be the opportunity for people that are non-accredited to invest in early stage companies. So that's a market that I advise everyone to watch. I don't know if it makes sense or not for your individual situation, but um, the sources of capital are really expanding. And I think that's also something to keep in mind when, you know, when we talk on this panel, the, the real truth is that you know, less than 10% of all the companies out there do get outside funding. So, um, you know, you have to keep in mind that um, raising outside capital is not a business or revenue model. Um, you really have to have a legitimate business and you raise outside money when you need to grow. And anything to look out for? KJ and Will had things to look out for in their respective uh, funding sources. Um, what about with crowdfunding? So I'm sorry, what was the question? Is there an, <laughs> anything to look out for? I, was looking at. I thought you were asking something else. <laughs> no, no. So uh, yeah, what should the entrepreneurs, uh, you know, when they're, they're looking at the, all these, uh, the these platforms, should there be, are there any warning signs for ones that perhaps they should stay away from? I, I think they're so new, it's hard to, to say, you know, which, how it'll shake out and which one will be survivors. I do know that, um, you know, you look at other industries and one of the things I learned at Goldman was actually it's not so great to be the first one in the market. Look at Facebook and you know, you can, you, you can look at a number of companies and you can see that just because you're the first in the market does not mean that you will be the survivor. I think what's really important is that you find your sector and you know your constituency and you cover it well and you focus on them and provide service for them. So um, I think there are a handful of options on re reward-based crowdfunding, so I would check out all of them. Um, on equity, I think that is an open game and I think, um, I would read everything you can on it and, and watch the market as it unfolds. So if I want to sell like re Florida real estate, swampland, is, uh, I, is there a specific crowdfunding site? There <laughs> actually <laughs> is. Now, there, there's, there's a crowdfunding site for just about everything and there is one that just sprung up six months ago that I heard about that is real estate. I think, you know, my personal opinion is that people, investors that go on to these sort of mass public crowdfunding sites are investors that maybe don't have enough deal flow or good deal flow on their own. Because at the end of the day, if you're gonna do something like a real estate investment, 
you shouldn't be doing that online. You should actually know that market and, and know the people. So one of the issues with AngelList and some of the other options out there is you know, you, you could be an accredited investor and participate in that. But chances are you're not going to actually meet the entrepreneur that you're going to put money into. So it becomes very much just a transaction online. And, you know, that, that may work for some people, but I think for a lot of investors, they would actually rather know and spend time with the entrepreneur and think, okay, I'm going to have an ongoing relationship. Mm -hmm. I want this to succeed. And so I think... I think it's important. And I, and I think actually as an entrepreneur, when you're thinking not only about your investors, but putting together a board, think about what you need in your company that you don't have. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's marketing expertise, or maybe it's more tech help. But you know, think about what you need that would help your company, and be very aggressive at reaching out to them. Because you know, most of the major VC firms have a huge portfolio of companies, and just you know, you think about the, the, individual, the, the management of the, the portfolio. There aren't enough hours in the day for them really to focus on every company. So they're pro you're probably not going to hear from them unless there's an issue or a problem, or you reach out to them. So I would say be very aggressive. Pick your advisors and pick your investors very carefully, mm -hmm. and then make them work for you. Yep. Well, so, Will, do you think that's true? I mean, do you sit on boards? I think the best CEOs in our portfolio do it really well, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. We think we're going to a board meeting with duties of governance and care and, and oversight, and that is true. But we're also going there to have a conversation about the goals of the company and how we can help deliver on them, whether it's through our network, partners that we can bring to the table, uh, help in recruiting, help in thinking through a restructuring plan, help in thinking through a relationship with a, a bank or even a relationship with a difficult investor. I mean, we get in, we get, we are active early stage lead investors. We're very comfortable in that role, and so we expect to have those kind of conversations. It never ceases to amaze me, though, the number of CEOs in our portfolio who, when we'll have a conversation about something we need to be working on together, they don't, they feel just because they took money that they can't be necessarily very aggressive with following up with us on things that, that need to be done. Um, this, I want to, one other thought, though, that I, wa I want to just sort of throw out there. As you think about taking money for your company, it's vitally important that you think about the, the expectations that are, are set around the performance of the business. This, this to me, is, is, is the sort of seminal thing you've got to understand in every investor relationship. And it becomes really clear when you start to see seed rounds um, where you've got venture firms and individual investors with various levels of experience. The, the day before you take money, you can change your plans, you can change what you're doing, you can shift the business. As soon as you take outside money, you have sold someone a set of expectations. And it's not to say that businesses don't pivot. They all pivot in some way or another as far as we've seen through our portfolio. And frankly, the growth of seed rounds, I think, has, has helped a lot in terms of giving early stage companies a lot of flexibility. But once you've taken outside money, you're in it until the outcome for those investors, whatever it may be. And, um, and that may be many years away. Um, so understanding their expe expectations, really deep down understanding their expectations and how they're going to react when you call them up and say, guess what? It didn't work, <laughs> right? Nobody wants to buy the product. We're going to try something else. Thinking through those conversations is one of the most important things you can do before you take the money. So let, let's flip the question around. We've uh, again. So, uh, KJ, how many um, how many companies go through your program each uh, each program? It, uh, usually around ten. We have thirteen in the program right now. And how many apply to be in the program? Over a thousand. Th so Over you were a thousand. So it's not a. It's harder to get into than Columbia. <laughs> and that's just per location. Yeah, that's, uh, that's per location. It's it's pretty competitive process. What do they need to do to get your attention? <laughs> they need to sh they need to show that they can really execute on you know first whenever you meet them. I think following up is, is huge. Yeah. Right. When you're talking about what your business is, what you're working on, it's great to follow up with whoever you've met with from TechStars and really keeping us in the loop. Right. You can send us updates on how your you know how your business is doing. You can ask for help. We'd love to help people that come to us. We started doing open office hours for anybody. It doesn't matter if you're a tech charge company or not. Uh, we're going to start that up once we finish the program. So meet with us. 
uh, in office hours and keep us posted on how you're progressing and ask for help. Will, how many, how many companies do you invest in per year, your firm? So we do about 20 seed deals a year and six or seven primary deals. And how many do you see? Gosh, I mean, we, we get inbound deal flow in the thousands. Um, but the, the bulk of our investing activity is actually quite outbound in the sense that we're targeting certain sectors. We're spending a lot of time trying to meet entrepreneurs in those sectors, see as many companies as we can in those sectors, and then make choices. And I'd say that accounts for 60% of the deals that we do. Um, the other 40% is inbound stuff, and it's inbound stuff that comes to us referred by people in the, in the portfolio. So among our 70 active portfolio companies, a lot of referrals come in through that direction. Or there are people that you know, we, we know we are excited to work with. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of sort of matching that needs to go on. Um, we can't process adequately the overall deal flow pool that comes to us. Uh, and most venture firms can't. So I'm an entrepreneur with an idea. What, what, in what way can I get your attention to look at my company, to give it a serious consideration? The best way to get to, to me or any of my partners or I think just about anybody else in the venture business is to be well referred by somebody in our portfolio. And if you're in sectors that are actually of interest to us, that's probably not that hard, to be honest, uh, because we have, you know, we have a bunch of active portfolio companies. The CEOs of those companies are not hard to get to. So it's referrals by and large. And Alicia, I'm, you yeah. know, there's, again, it's um, often hard to find angels. Um, mm -hmm. They don't have, you know, big storefronts. They don't have gigantic portfolios of right. successful companies. How do people get to you? Yeah, so uh, th it's a good point. Yeah, it, it, it's not possible to have that kind of uh, access to any one angel because, they, um, truthfully, the angels would just be overwhelmed with entrepreneurs knowing about them. I mean, even just having a website, like I get so many inquiries from you know, all over the world, and it's just, it, there's, you don't have enough time to respond to everyone. Um, so I'm very proactive. I was just jotting down a list of um, all the different ways that I uh, identify entrepreneurs. Um, so I, I would agree with Will that um, if someone is recommended to me by someone I trust, then I absolutely will spend time with them. Maybe it's an hour on the phone or a coffee meeting um, and see where that goes. But I'm, I'm kind of agnostic as to where I find the companies that I invest in. And from my perspective, you know, the more companies that I see, the better, but kind of on my terms, um, how it fits into my schedule. So I, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm a part of a couple of angel networks. So I'm very active in those networks. And I'm always going to the screenings where they, you know, every month they narrow down, like, let's say, eight to 10 companies that they think are worth our while. So I'm seeing companies through those networks. I do a lot of speaking engagements. Um, so whether it's, you know, judging the Lauren Wall competition at Columbia or like um, judging the NYU venture competition the other day. So then I'm exposed to a short list of companies through those activities. Anytime I, I'm a member of a number of meetups in the city, so if I'm not going to the actual event, anytime I see them send out the emails, I'm clicking into those companies that are presenting for you know pitch events, and I'm doing my own research and then reaching out to them if uh, you know if I if if I'm interested. Uh, there are companies that may contact me through my website or angel list. I if I'm interested and want to learn more, maybe I'll follow up on those fronts. Um, I follow some of the contests that might be online. So if there's a company in the New York area that stands out in like a Wall Street Journal competition or an ink competition, I'm curious to learn more and research a little bit more about them. Um, I'm going to all the demo days for the incubators, um, but preferably I've met with the companies and are aware of them way before the demo days even occur. And KJ and I were talking about that earlier. Um, uh, yeah, and then through my own alumni networks, I did Wharton undergrad, and so there's another kind of a funnel of, and was just judging the Wharton competition in Philly about two weeks ago, so that was another funnel of companies. So, so I'm open to however I can potentially find great entrepreneurs, and I try to fill up my schedule so that I don't have a bit of free time left, because the more that I see for maybe, you know, every hundred or so companies that I see, maybe there's one that, that I continue that long dialogue with. And, and that's, you know, that's a, that's a real, really low probability of investing, especially considering that a lot of those hundred that I'm starting with are already pre-screened by a lot of these meetups or 
uh, by the accelerators or the incubators or the school competitions or the angel network. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to stay out there and try to stay really involved in the community and mentor through Astio or like follow Springboard or, I mean, just however I can potentially meet great people, I'm open to it. They told us we could go till five after because we started late. Okay. All right. We got 15. All right. Good. So we're going to start. I'm going to ask one more question to the panel, and then we're going to do Q&A. So think of some questions. Is there a microphone for the audience, or? Yeah. I don't. I, mean, I don't care. We can hear you, but I don't know if you want it for the. For the. Yeah. Um, so. How do you work together? Um, you know, there's there's four different ways of funding here. Is it one or the other? Is it some, all of them at the same time? Um, I, I know, Alicia, you have a strong opinion here. I know. I, so I, I don't find any of these options mutually exclusive. And I um, have the greatest degree of respect for all of my colleagues up here. And I think it really is up to the entrepreneur to figure out what is right for them and their company. You know, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I'm happy to invest in a company coming out of one of the accelerators. One, uh, Wrapped Media came out of Techstars in Boulder, and they're in my portfolio. I'm happy to co-invest with VCs. Another one of my companies, CSA Trading, did a crowdfunding campaign, and it was phenomenal because it helped her figure out uh, one of the products that she was going to launch. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, I think that they're all really great options, and it's spectacular that entrepreneurs have so many options in front of them, and it's really for them to determine what's right for them and when. JJ, I mean, do people invest before you? Yeah, I mean, sometimes there, there'll be companies that come in, maybe they have a million dollars or more in funding. And it's, it's, it's weird because these companies will be like, oh, we're too far along for tech stars, or we're too far, far along for an accelerator. But what happens is sometimes these companies aren't growing, and they're flat. And when they come in through a program like Techstars, they, we really force them to think about things that they probably wouldn't have, really put, uh, put pressure on them. And then you can see the, the companies growing faster. But I think it's the point that was made earlier. I think entrepreneurs really need to determine what kind of business that they want to have. Because you can, you can be fine just bootstrapping. And if you don't have any outside investors, a $20, $40 million exit, if you're 100% shareholder, that's perfectly fine, right? I think you need to determine what's motivating your investors as well. You have to look at how they're being compensated. So if you're working with VCs, it's a hit-driven business, right? They want massive exits. Uh, they're not going to be happy with a 2x return on their capital. So you really have to be sure of what you're building and what type, you know, what type of business you want to have and what types of investors you want to have on, uh, in your cap table. So Will, Alan Patrikoff uh, on stage said that he didn't want, and he has more experience than all of us put together doing this so long. Um, he didn't like to invest in companies with a messy cap table, with a lot of investors. Um, would you invest in something that went through, say, a crowdfunding site where there are 100 other people? Oh, yeah, absolutely we would, and we have. You know, I think there's, I think Alan's point, and it's, it's, it's a sound point, is having just every one of those people or institutions or whatever they may be has got to sign uh, every every major transaction that happens, every corporate event, every financing event, shareholder docs are going to go out. <laughs> and you want to be sure you're going to get all those shareholder documents back. Um, I think there's not really an issue there. I think these approaches are all quite sort of collaborative and, and, and complementary. I think the growth of the seed ecosystem is one of the best things to happen for entrepreneurs. It's one of the best things that's happened for us uh, as a venture firm. And, yeah, so there are a few more shareholders on the cap table. It's not that big a deal. All right. Well, so, it, oh, yeah, sorry, actually, sorry. One of the great things about crowdfunding on a reward basis is you're not giving away any equity. So if you have a product that you want to test in the marketplace, put it out there, see if you can get sales, get customer feedback, and you've given away no equity. So maybe you've raised 25,000, 50,000, <coughs> maybe even 100. A couple of projects that have been on over the past year have raised a million dollars or more. So, you know, you can raise money without giving away any equity in your company. So this, you know, crowdfunding um, on a reward basis is really before these other stages where you actually give equity away. But yet, you know, a few weeks ago, Facebook bought Oculus VR, which was crowdfunded, and they left a bad taste in a lot of the people who invested in the company through the crowdfunding because they didn't see any yeah. of that $2 billion. Well, so the, the issue there, I think, you ha I, I think it's, you know, when you put money up on a reward-based platform, you're not investing. You're getting something back. You're pre-purchasing that product. You don't own the company. 
So it's very comparable. Somebody said to me, well, it's, it'd be like if I bought a pair of Tory Burch shoes and on a pre-order basis, and then I think I own some equity in her company. It, it's not that. And so people who put up money for reward-based get something. It's a prize. It's a T-shirt, a water bottle. It's a pre-order of a product. That is very clear. That's very different from other platforms where you're giving away equity. So to me, it's like, you know, just, you know, a after Oculus raised money on crowdfunding, they w then went to VC. So, you know, to me, it's just a way to test market your product. It's a way to get a little bit of money, some pre-orders, do marketing. There's mm -hmm. huge marketing campaigns that happen now. VCs are looking at some of the crowdfunding platforms to find good products and good entrepreneurs. So to me, it's, it's a pretty um, efficient uh, way to test mar market your product and get some money and get some visibility. So I think it's very important in the funding chain and you don't give away any equity. Mm -hmm. And so you do have a clean cap table and you can move up to an accelerator or a angels or VC. You know. Thanks. Oh, do we have audience questions? Oh, we do. All right. <laughs> so some rules, keep the questions short. Um, and don't pitch your company, all right? Um, <laughs> hey everyone, thanks so much for coming and thanks for a valuable insight. Um, this is actually just a follow-up qu question to what we just talked about, right? So we've all heard about the new SEC regulation on unaccredited investors regarding online fundraising, right? Um, how do you, what do you guys think about the impact that can make, that can make to the um, early investment industry in general? And what kind of platforms do you think can emerge successful? What are some things that make platforms better than others? Um, equity-based investments. Anybody? Anybody want to take that? Well, I, I, I think the, um, I, you know, I, I spent 21 years on Wall Street, so I spent my first career thinking about <coughs> disclosure, doing public documents, public offerings. So I'm kind of an expert in that field. And I think now, okay, so what we're doing is we're opening up the ability for pretty much anyone to come in and invest on an equity basis. And while I think that sounds good in theory, I think, I think what's going to happen is I think a lot of individuals are going to lose money because it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. It's not like everybody's going to pick an investment, it's going to turn into a Facebook. What happens with early stage investing is mostly you lose money. Mm -hmm. On a portfolio of 10 companies, maybe one or two give you your return, some break even, and some go out of business. So that's a very treacherous market if you ask me and for most people it's not appropriate in their asset allocation class so you know I, I, I think it might work if you if it's very locally based in your community where maybe you know the company maybe it's a restaurant or something like that maybe that makes sense but I think I think it's problematic I think that's why we haven't seen regulations for two years because you know, and then you, it's, it's disclosure. You, before you make an investment, you want to have adequate information to make the investment. So there's a big burden that's going to be put on um, early stage companies to provide the appropriate disclosure. So I don't know. I, I, I think it's a little bit treacherous. Let's, let's hope it works out in some form. Uh, I've heard various perspectives on investing in entrepreneurs that have had previous failures and some have said they'll invest in entrepreneurs that have failed before and they want to see them go through that grind and some have said they want to look at, at successes only. So what are your perspectives and thank you for speaking. Uh, I don't mind. I, it, I think it just depends on the personal story, right, and how that affected the person, what they learned from it, whether something that they learned can be applicable in a, a business in the, in the future. Um, and, you know, look, people grow, right? The business that someone launched when they were 18 and failed at is very different from where they are in their stage of their life when they're 26 and doing that. So, so no, I mean, to, to be general, it all depends. But I would never say that that would be a deal breaker. No, not from my perspective. Institutionally, we have the same view. In fact, we can point to a number of instances where we've backed people uh, who we lost money with before. But we backed them a second time because we believe that they had grown tremendously and that they were going to be great value creators the next time around and we've forged great partnerships with some of those people. Some, some of those have been very successful outcomes second time around. And I, I think it's really, what, what you, sorry, I don't know Is if that, I'm going out of yeah. order here. Um, I think what you learn when something doesn't work out is absolutely critical to success. I honestly think, you know, some of the best entrepreneurs are ones that have 
And I, I think we need to redefine failure. It's not failure, it's learning. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like if someone's learning any new skill or any industry, they're gonna have things that work and things that don't work. And that's particularly true in entrepreneurship where you're creating the future. So I, I think of it actually as, as, as a help in most cases. And, and I think if someone can come back from having something that didn't work out and have the guts and the courage and stamina to go back at it again, I think that's a big plus. One sec, just for the uh, recordings. Once somebody um, receives outside capital, let's say it's, they give up 10% of their company and there's a decision to be made, who gets the final say, the VC or the entrepreneur? I'll, I'll take that. So the, the whole, um, when, when you take outside money, you're not immediately giving up control of your business. What we do expect is that once you've taken capital from us or probably from any of these equity sources, not from, uh, from warrants-based crowdfunding, um, you at that point have a duty to report to your shareholders because you now have outside shareholders. You have a duty to report in terms of performance of the business. And we expect you to have a board of some kind, a board of directors. And we're probably not on it if all we've given you is a small seed check, but we do expect you to have some governance mechanisms for making decisions. Now, if you're the founder of the company and you're the CEO of the company and you own 90% or you and your co-founders together own 90%, maybe you are the board and you seek one outside independent director and that group is the group that makes the decision. But the, the, to, to, to sort of abstract from your, your, your question, in, in our world, Control creates nothing, right? We don't, we don't own controlling stakes in our businesses. We're not asset buyers, right? We have to help entrepreneurs grow companies, and we typically are growing from a base of almost nothing when we invest. Nothing happens until things start to grow, and over time you realize that um, you know, if the people aren't motivated and if they don't own enough and they don't feel like they have enough to say, nothing's gonna grow either. I uh, want to add on to that. So oftentimes if you have uh, maybe a VC or maybe even an uh, angel network invest and lead a deal, an investment in a company, there'll be certain provisions in the term sheet that are specifically delineate what the entrepreneur can't do, right? And, it, and they're, um, they're pretty obvious things to protect them as investors, right? So the goal from the investor standpoint is not to micromanage your company, right? That's futile. But there are things like, hey, you know, entrepreneur cannot take out X amount in personal loan from company money. Hey, entrepreneur cannot, you know, add um, one of their family members to the company or whatever. Or, you know, so they're, th and the, on, the investors have information rights, as, as Will mentioned. So at any point in time, if they wanted to look at the company books, they could, right? So there are certain provisions that are outlined that when you read through them, if you maybe Googled like common provisions and term sheets protecting investors, they probably you know give you a little bit more information on th that front. But it's usually things like that, right? Like approval of members being added to the board and um, approval of you know potential sale of the company and ter terms of that sale, right? But it's not meant to um, constrict the entrepreneur on the daily operational basis, if that makes sense. I think we have time for one more. All right. Um, let's go over there. Yeah, so, quick question for one. Just wondering, with um, your experience in crowdfunding, do you see what are the characteristics of the campaigns that usually succeed as opposed to ones that don't get their goals? Yes, I, I would say there's, um, if, if, if you study the market, you can see some things that predict success. It doesn't mean it will be true in 100% of the cases, but it really is the amount of money you're raising and the size of your network and how hard you work. Three things. So if you have a big network, um, you're more likely to succeed. And if you do the work, there are clearly things you need to do. And what about the, the amount of money? Of, what, what do you recommend? And the amount of money, I mean, I think we, we actually have a table, you know, given how big your network is, how much money that you want to raise. And then you can do the mathematical equation to kind of give you an indication. And so you know if you want to, say, raise, you know, $25,000 and you have a network of about 500 people, 
You can just do the math and then, okay, these are the steps. You need to do these six things over a month. If you do those successfully, your chances of getting that money are pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have it at Plum Alley, and I'm ha we, we have uh, in-depth conversations with people that apply to our site, so I'd be happy to share it with you. Well, let's thank all the panelists. Thank you, Gary. And thank you, Jerry. Thank you.